Rainbow Six Siege is a hard game to play. Winning in Siege is something few people on Earth can do with any regularity, but above that is the challenges presented with competing at a professional level on the international stage. You get three chances a year to prove you're the best. Some will win seemingly against all odds, coming from the lower bracket to come up and claim their title. For others, lifting the hammer felt inevitable from the word go, proving why favorites exist. But for every story of triumph, there has to be tragedy. There has to be a runner-up. Someone has to go home with the silver medal. But in failure, there are lessons to be learned, growth to be had. If you play in one of the big three regions, you have access to those who stood upon the mountaintop before you. When those who have won the last game of the season are your peers and willing to pass down the secrets of success, everyone around you will grow. In the last six years, Europe, Brazil, and North America have all held the hammer twice, all establishing themselves as the best region in the world at one time or another. In these regions, iron sharpens iron on a day-to-day -day basis, and it shows when they step up on the stage to compete with one another. There are other regions, though. Along the Pacific rest Japan, Oceania, Asia, and South Korea. All of these regions have shown potential. Each of them have produced a team that did amazing things, but none of them have ever held a title. None have ever lifted the hammer. Enter PSG Talon, a team struggling to find its way, whose success at their last international land appearance at the Atlanta Major can be counted in rounds, not maps, and certainly not teams beaten. There's talent on this team, though. Like all those who make it to professional level, they have the potential to do great things, they just need a little bit of help. So, as an esports organization, when your team is taking the role of David, facing the Goliath that is international powerhouses, what do you do? Well, you give them a sling, of course. In the form of Fabian, a man who knows how to win. I fucking hate losing. I hope you do too. So then let's fucking win the game instead. Let's go back on stage, boys. We have this. In my entire six months here. But what the fuck are we doing? We're timid. We're not talking. We're shouting over each other. Fucking wake up! Is this how we want to go out of the tournament? We've shown everyone here that we were the best team in this tournament in group stages. Fucking do it! You guys got this! Communication and coordination! We're one by one dying everywhere! Time to wake up! Fucking get the energy! Fire in your assets! Get this shit done! There's only been one man in the history of Siege to lift the hammer three times, and now he's been tasked with bringing this roster to the main stage of a major. Fabian is one of the greatest minds the game has ever seen, and he sat down with me to discuss this new endeavor, along with the state of professional play in general. Before him, one of his greatest challenges, intending to not only bring up a roster, but an entire region. The self-proclaimed god emperor and greatest player the game has ever seen isn't taking the challenge lightly, however, being realistic about the process of turning this team into a true contender. He's not one to shy away from the harsh realities his new team faces, being brutally honest about the state of Korean Siege. We're looking at it from the perspective of I am in APAC now, but the project in itself, winning an SI with them, I think is far, far, far into the future. You know, that like it's, it's almost unreasonable that it would be like that just because of uh, just the region overall doesn't have it in them right now. But three or four years into the future, you never know. But if I'll stay three or four years in APAC, I don't know the answer to either. You know, it's, it's a very hard question to, to know the answer to. The end goal is always to win the biggest tournament of the year, of course, though, right? Of yeah. course, but let's be realistic. Oh, of course. I, I do find it interesting that Talon really was open to a very long-term building process. It seems that most esports organizations just wouldn't go for that. I mean, if they aren't open for long-term these days, then, like, what, what can I really do? Like, I, I'm in the boats, and, and it has to take its time to get to the destination, you know? You can't just hire someone and expect instant results, especially when... The region overall has not just done anything for, I don't know, it feels like 114 years, right? It, they haven't done anything for a very, very long time. We have seen some interesting teams coming out of different regions right now, though. We've seen Mena pick up a little bit. We've seen Bleed and Team Bliss do well at Invite. Are those the teams you're looking to compete with first before you go out to the big three regions? It has to be. I mean, the first year and what I want to put us on the map for is to, first of all, get ourselves as a team into that kind of fourth tier position where we're not an NA team, we're not a European team, and we're not a Brazilian team, but we get respected as the outsider. That's something that we never really had against Korean teams before when I worked in other regions. It's just when you got a Korean team, you picked your, your own weak maps against them because you no matter, it didn't matter how strong they were, they weren't as strong as you, even on your weakest. So you always pick the shit maps. Um, now that's the goal to change that, right? And then long term, 
a year and a half, two years, maybe to get Korea to be the fourth region to be up there and competing, because I think it becomes like a trickle back effect. You know, if we play well in Korea and we practice Korean teams, I teach us the absolute basics, then that will be taught in a different way to teams we play against and practice against, which in long term would develop all of Korea, not just PSG town. So it's it's definitely for long term, two years, I'd say make us the fourth best region in the world. And then three or four, then we're going to try competing to maybe be mixed into those and actually not call it just the top three regions, but call it the top four regions. I like that. In your release video with Talon, you did discuss that you're never going to be the team with expectations on you. But I do yep. wonder if that's true. Obviously, coming out oh, of a region sure that's that's historically weaker, right? The players themselves wouldn't have had an expectation. But bringing on a three-time world champion, bringing on Pengu as well, does that add a little bit of stress these players may not have seen before going into international events? Oh, for them, it definitely does. But overall, as a team, that's something we also have to work against, right? Because it's not the, the, it's not the reality. I mean, how many maps have Korea won against Tier 1 opponents? And I'm not talking about when they go to an event and they play a Japanese team or when they play a, a Southeast Asian team. I mean, yeah, sure, Bleed it can be considered a little bit different. Same, same with Bliss. Same with the former D+. Or, um, D plus. But today, like, if you look at outside, how many games have Korea, without d pluses run, won against EU, NA, or Brazil? I have no idea how many it is, but I doubt it's much more than 10. And I was talking maps, not games. And I, like, think, I feel like 10 is even reaching for it, you know? I can't speak to Korea as a region overall, but I did look into Talon's run at the Atlanta Major, and they did bring in an impressive seven rounds. So there is, <laughs> there is work to do. Yeah, I mean, seven rounds is uh, nothing, right? It's, it's, it doesn't matter if you win seven rounds. You need to win games. So seven rounds is one. Let's put that into one map, and then we'll be happy. The history of the region isn't the only struggle the team will face when looking to qualify for the next major. Something Fabian has been very honest about, saying that it's possible, if not likely, that we won't see Talon in Manchester this summer. Although there's worse things than not having to go to Manchester. So you've mentioned the possibility of missing the Manchester major. However, yeah. Talon did qualify for Atlanta. Given the fact that they have qualified for these events before, is this an indication that it may get worse before it gets better as you rebuild this team? It's not going to get worse before it gets better, but there's historically been two teams dominating the region, which is Firex and D+. Uh, PSG Talon qualified on the third spot. But that spot doesn't exist anymore for Korea because it got removed. So now we're fighting against those bigger titans, at least the titans of the region, which will give us a little bit more of a fight for it. I do think it's in the boys, but you know we haven't had enough time to really look at things. We just came in last week, so we've only been with the team for just, just above one week. And with that, we have had four days of travel, right, since flying back and forth to Korea takes a while. So we're looking at like seven days, eight days worth of work with them. It's not a lot, which means that we don't have much time to teach them how to play the game, which we do over the summer, and then we do for next stage. So next stage is when we're looking to really get everything to work. Add in a language barrier between the new coach and the players, and it would seem the hill they have to climb is beginning to seem insurmountable. But with a dominant 7-0 win on their first play day in the Korean League, it seems as though things are already looking up. Is there a language barrier there, or do the players speak a common language with you? How does that exactly work as a coach? So we're all fluent in uh, Mongolian. Okay, now uh, <laughs> no, 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 speak Mongolian. No, uh, you almost had so, me. So, uh, almost had, yeah. We, they speak Korean to each other in game, but there are four players who do understand English. There's one player that speaks English, and then there's so well out of those four, one of them actually speak it too. And then there's the fifth player that doesn't understand it at all. He barely speaks Korean. The player says either, so uh, I guess he can't talk at all. But we have a coach that they used to have before, Dongwook, who is also our translator. He's now taking a step to management position instead, so we can have a translator for us. Obviously, that still is a language barrier that we don't know if he translates what we're saying the best way. But we can only hope and see how, how far it takes us. And I think that the improvement we saw from one week of boot camp into the game day today with a 7-0 win, that was a complete domination. I think that you can already see the difference in Tal PSG talent from the last stage and PSG talent this stage. As boastful as he might be, Fabian had a more human reason for taking up this new position than I had expected to hear from him, proving that even those striving for greatness probably have a lot more going on than you realize. 
what led to the decision to go and try to build an entire region? Was it just the challenge, or was there more to it? I've been challenged in my entire career, right? And I've achieved everything that there is to achieve, both as a player and as a coach. I mean, yeah, sure, you could win some majors as a coach as well, but it it it's a rough time working at home in Europe on European scheduling because you work every evening and you work every afternoon, which means that you miss out on everything around you family, friends, all of that stuff. I've already sacrificed that once. Going back now, I don't think that it would be reasonable for me to do that again, especially when I live with my girlfriend and, you know, looking for the future and we don't know how long things take before everything gets even more serious. You don't want to sacrifice all of it one more time. So it's much easier to work in Korea where I get up from bed 5, 5.45 a.m., start working at 6, and then I get off for the afternoon and the evenings. That's much easier than working from 1 to p.m. until midnight. So it, it, it's definitely a work-life trade rather than it is a, oh, yeah, I, I really believe in Korea. But then again, I also think that it's more of a challenge for me as an individual. Now I'm going to a region that before this, I would consider the eighth worst region. So like they are the eighth best, which is really the only region that's actually worse than them is South Asia. And that's like India and Pakistan and Bangladesh. Not Bangladesh, sorry, that's another... Is that right? That's, that's the country inside India, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's Bangladesh. Those countries suck at Rainbow Six Siege. And therefore, well, this is the worst one that comes to land. And I just see it as a challenge. Am I as good as I think myself to be? Can I change around, in my eyes, quite the wordless region into being decent? I don't know. Uh, but I'm about to find out, right? It's, it's going to be a massive, massive challenge. But that's also the fun of it, because now I put myself in a position where I actually have to kind of show that I am as good as I say. He spoke about the time commitment that pro play requires, but how much should it ask of you? We did have a lot more tournaments available back when G2 was at its peak. We had pro league majors, we had pro league finals and all of that. It seems like we kind of swung wildly back and forth between having way too little pro play and way too much. As someone who did go through it all and at one point even seemed to burn out a little bit, what do you think is the right schedule for Siege? Is it what we have right now? Should we be doing less? Should we be doing more? What would an ideal schedule for the season be for you? Right now, I think we have way too few. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, I think that we're working way too few uh, events as players um, and talent at that. Um, so I, I would say that three stages was the best, but we need to still have like one month break during the year that it's like everybody takes just off because you do burn out if you sit there every day every week for years like we did like before i stopped playing the longest break i had was like five days as a player you know over christmas and new year but five days is nothing like you don't regain or reset anything so yeah you, you need to change around a little bit and i think that we need a bit more right now or at least that's what i think to to make like the game more interesting to watch kind of pops up, gets very exciting, and then goes away for a long time. Do you yeah. think that just kind of limits it as a spectator sport? I, I mean, if you think about it, it's very intense for a few short weeks, right? We have all the leagues at the same time happening. And then it stops for three months during the summer. Like, what? <laughs> What's going on? It, it doesn't make much sense. But yeah, it, it's, it's a pop-up. And I, yeah, as you say, I think it's, it, it's better for the spectator than it is for the players, because you just have such a long off season that you kind of take such a long break that people, I don't know. They, I, I just don't think it's as, as serious as it used to be in terms of how people take it, like work ethic and stuff like this. And I think it has a lot to do with us not having enough tournaments. And especially the fact that it seems as though invite was hours ago and yet we're starting our new professional play today. Is it, yeah. do you think it's too much of a struggle to ask teams that spent months preparing for Invitational to then come back a few weeks later and compete against teams who have done nothing but prepare for the local season? Do you think that takes away from those teams? I mean, the thing is, it doesn't matter how long they've been preparing because the patch that they don't know about that is coming up, uh, that one will decide how the game is being played, right? So it doesn't really matter how long they've been preparing because all that preparation can be changed because of the new operator. So it, it, it's... It's not really unfair. What I think is more unfair is that the break is too short this time. I mean, it's one week transfer window and then you go into it. If you're a team at SI, do you want to make a change with one week before the season starts? 
I don't think so. So it's more on that way that if you've actually attended the event, you're in, in the back seat because you couldn't actually make player changes even if you wanted to. Or, and if you did, you will have too short of a time to actually build up a full map pool and be completely ready, you know? Like, you have time, sure. You can get a few maps down, maybe six, maybe seven. But the proper professional team you want to have, I would say that you want nine. If you can get that, and it's another thing. But what you need to aim for is to have a nine map pool. So I, I think it's more that way, that you, you didn't have time to do changes. You maybe didn't have time to rework your map pool. So a little bit what you're saying, a little bit bad planning, I think, or like scheduling. But what can we do about it? We follow the rules we're set and given, and then we do our best. Absolutely. You just you deal with the hand you're dealt, right? Yeah. You, you don't have another choice, right? Fabian brings more to the table than just a strategic mind. He's also one of the biggest personalities in the scene. Now, their quality isn't good enough. But Miros, I, I actually want to turn this this interview around here a little bit because I think that I've had too many interviews, and I th I think it's time for me to actually interview you for once. So I have a question I, here. Like, right. how do you feel about your performance as a caster, and what have you done this season to improve it? Well, I don't have much to say. It was GGS. Perfect. Well, short for words for the first time ever in your entire life. Really appreciated. I mean, you're shorter than me in real life, so I'm fine with the words being shorter. That is technically correct. We discuss how he became the best interview in Siege, and why we don't see it anymore. We had plenty of nice guys in Rainbow Six Siege before you joined, but you were the one to introduce the concept of a heal. You introduced that seemingly intentionally, just seeing that the scene needed a little bit more spice to it on a personal level. Was that just because you intentionally created that persona to add to the Rainbow Six scene, or was it just you saying, you know, I could be a bit more of myself right now and it would probably be good? I mean, it's both me being myself, but it was for mainly team reasons, because there were players in the team that didn't handle pressure as well as I did, and they struggled more with, like, the mental game, if that makes sense. So if I can take everybody to hate me, I don't give a shit what other people think of me. If I can make them hate me, they won't hate my teammates. Taking off pressure from them makes my life easier, makes their life easier, and we play better as a group. So it's a, it's a mix of things there. Now, it's certainly, from a viewer standpoint, made the game just a little bit more exciting, especially because you were interviewing basically every time you played a game. Yeah. And we haven't really seen another player have that level of, I don't know, maybe access to post-game interviews just because no one really won like G2 won. We've seen a couple players have glimpses of that personality, like uh, Super, Alamal, Felipox a little bit. Do you feel anyone has really truly lived up to your legacy of being that interesting character in our siege scene? I don't think people are allowed to, really. Um, I was heavily put in the place by Ubisoft in terms of I was getting fines. I was media banned twice because of stuff I said. So I don't think the people are really allowed to. But then again, I also think that they don't understand the the people that they're trying to entertain, because that's what it is in the end of the day, right? It, it's entertainment, and uh, we're not allowed to entertain the way we know that people enjoy. Well, there's not much we can do about that. What I think with players coming in and doing it, I think people are afraid of fucking up their chances in case things wouldn't go right in the team they're in right now, you know? If you fuck up your chances and you shit talk someone, well, why would they pick you up? Well, they won't, because you talk too much shit to them. So you don't screw over your chances in the future. You don't talk shit talk people that you might need for your improved career. So it's 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 a long thing of different stuff basically happening that people maybe not think about so much, but it's definitely there. I think with people talking the scene gets far more interesting. It's it's a better overall you get invested a little bit more when people go back and forth, yeah. right? Because you start caring about what they say and you start caring about the people that that are doing it so it's it's very it's very strange to me yeah i'll, I'll admit uh you know i i always loved rooting against canadian because i was a g2 fan but <laughs> hearing hearing him scream out oh, shit. why am i so much fucking better than you god damn you're just a fucking ump and you you fucking little shit still get fucking hang i'm old this shit with the worst gun in the game you're playing twitch geo Twitch. That was the moment that can make you a fan of anybody, uh, and losing things like that seems to be a bit of a, an overall negative, I would say. Yeah, we're running away from those people, which is very unfortunate. So, without laying the expectations on the talents to be the greatest team in the world right away, 
we look to the current kings and what they have to do to establish themselves as the best there's ever been. Going back to a more overall view of Pro League, I am curious. W7M have spent the last year proving they're the most dominant team in the world, world currently. And interestingly yeah. enough, the last time they lost a grand final, it was to G2 with you at the helm. You refused to allow G2 to pass the torch in that moment, but what about now? At what point is that Brazilian roster unquestionably the best to ever touch the game? What do they have to do to prove that? Oh, they're, they're at least one more year of dominating away. I mean, we won Pro League titles, which in today's currency is majors, right? We have four of those. Or do we? Is it three? We have three of them, never mind. We have one normal major and three Pro League titles, which puts us in four majors. They've got two majors and one SI. We got two SIs. And we also have all of these minor tournaments that nobody really gives a shit about, like a DreamHack and uh, some other like national titles, but national ones doesn't matter at all. So they have still got quite a long step to take. We also have a second place at a major. Sure, they have a second place at SI, which I get rate higher than our second place at the major. But at the same time, we were dominating the game completely for two years. It wasn't even close. And then we look at W7M, and yeah, they're still close, and they're losing maps quite heavily. So... I think that we still have a few more steps to see from W7M, which is now Furia, before I will consider them better than what we were. They aren't yet the greatest to ever do it, but as of today, the former W7M roster, now under the Furia banner, have provided the yardstick the rest of the world will have to try to measure up to. I also discussed Pro League and some of the other history along with the state of the game with Fabian, but that's for another video. In terms of the new PSG talent head coach, I'll let him do his own outro. Is there anything you'd like to say to anyone watching this video, just so you're aware? I don't have a primarily Siege audience, so they might not give a shit, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, even if they don't give a shit, that's kind of funny, because to me, if people want to get involved and be interested, they should come support us in PSG Town in Korea. I mean, it's like, what better time to start watching Siege? If you're looking for, for a new game to start watching, first of all, the game is having its second renaissance. So we're coming back and actually starting to become a proper game again. Number two, PSG Town has just entered the scene which obviously they had talent before, but now we partnered up with PSG and they brought on me and Pengu, who is my right-hand man from all of my adventures as a player and all my success as a player. So me and him are coach and assistant coach. And we're trying to revive the, basically the, the, the second worst region in the world. We're trying to make them actually good by bringing in the two most achieved players in the game. That's pretty nuts. It's a good place so to start. If, <laughs> yeah, if you want to start watching Rainbow Six Siege now, or maybe you're a Siege fan that have just lost your feeling for other teams, or whatever it is that you want to do, if you want to follow a journey, because honestly, it's like we're playing some video game where it's like build your own nation, you know? It's like we're starting from absolute bottom, where they have no really superstars, they have no really good teams, and we could count on one hand probably the maps that this region has won, except for the best team that they had back three years ago, but that team also just came kind of disappeared as well right because they didn't have the depth they only had one layer of playing so if you guys want to support us we will be very grateful and i'm happy to be being have been here and thank you for having me with fresh talent joining the scene around the world and a new region poised to become a true contender it seems as though professional play in rainbow six siege is only going to get better from here i'll be following the journey psg talents are embarking on and bringing you updates on the project whenever i can it's a monumental task that's going to take time but if you're into an underdog story this is the perfect time to get on board. The future looks bright, and I can't wait to be a part of it. As it stands today, PSG Talons are 2-0 with dominant 7-0 and 7-2 victories. Their socials will be linked below, along with Pengus, who co-streams the games when they're live. I encourage you to give it a watch if it's in your time zone. With that, though, this is Purple signing off. Have a wonderful night, and always remember to smile. Thanks, guys. I mean, you're short. I mean, in real life, so I'm fine with the words being shorter. That is technically correct. All right. Everything every way and kind of way that you can possibly be shorter you are. It, it was nice seeing you. Enjoy the rest of the Wish week. I could say off. the same. I know. I Have know. a good night, Kicks. Thing. Have a good night, Kicks. Bye, Fabian. Bye-bye.